Hello, everybody. It's time for our everyday at eight lecture again. This is a daily program that I envisaged uh, so that a lot of people across the country can revise together with me uh, all the important aspects of English literature. We started yesterday. Uh, we have also formed a telegram group where I have been sharing quizzes and various other uh, useful material. I will share the link to the telegram group here in the video description or a comment. Please um, join if you feel like it so that we can make use of the materials and uh, quizzes that I share. The purpose of this um, program every day at eight is to deal with all the aspects of English literature like I do in the classroom. And uh, this will be for some time uh, an unpaid program, of course, but because a lot of students have paid fees uh, and attended classes with me, uh, I cannot do it endlessly, but I have to introduce a small fees, very small fees, uh, just a few hundreds, but not now, eventually. Uh, yesterday, we talked in very great detail about uh, the beginning of English literature, old English period, up to Chaucer. Today, we have to talk about uh, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales onwards. Many of you have uh, probably attended yesterday's session, so it would be meaningful to recap a little bit of what happened yesterday and uh, then go on to today's portions, right? So I will just ask you questions that are very relevant for our exams. What is the name of the Beowulf manuscript? Please post in the live comments. What is the name of the Beowulf manuscript? It is Novel Cordex. Cotton Vitalius, another name is also there. Novel Cordex is the famous name. The Beowulf manuscript is called Novel Cordex. Okay. Um, yesterday we talked about Venerable Bede's ecclesiastical history of the English race. Do you remember in which century it was written? In which century was Venerable Bede's Ecclesiastical History of the English Race written? Post in comments, please. It is the eighth century. Which is the famous poem? Next question. Which is the famous poem where the crucifix is thinking about uh, Christ's crucifixion? The crucifix is remembering and talking about Christ. Which is that famous poem? You can post your answer in the comments. The crucifix talks about Christ in which form? In the dream of the rood. It is in the dream of the rood. Rood means crucifix or cross. Then, uh, from which century to which century were the crusades? The crusades are the um, wars between uh, Europeans and the Arabs. I did not talk about everything that I'm asking you today. Uh, yesterday, I did not talk about crusades, but I'm just filling in the gaps. What I didn't talk about yesterday, I will cover today like that. From which century to which century? From 11th century to 13th century. Uh, very simple question. In which year was the peasants' revolts? In which year was the peasants' revolt? I'm sure you know that 1381. The peasants' revolt was in 1381. What kind of plague was Black Death? What kind of plague was Black Death? Black Death is bubonic plague. Black Death is bubonic plague because such details also sometimes they will ask about. Then, 
from which year to which year was the Hundred Years' War? And between which countries was the Hundred Years' War? From which year to which year was the Hundred Years' War? And between which countries was the Hundred Years' War waged? 1337 to 1453. The Hundred Years' War was between 1337 and 1453, and it was waged between England and France. The Hundred Years' War was waged between England and France. Where did uh, William Caxton establish his printing press? In which place in London did William Caxton establish his printing press? William Caxton established his printing press. I'm, I can see many of you uh, writing the answers. They, they, uh, the, the printing press was established in Westminster. Westminster, very good. Then from which year to which year was the Wars of the Roses? From which year to which year? Very good. 1455 to 1485. 1455 to 1485, Wars of the Roses. Then, um, in which year was uh, Thomas Beckett assassinated? In which year was Thomas Beckett assassinated? Eleven seventy. Eleven seventy. Yeah, uh, many of you are saying Gutenberg. Um, William Caxton learned printing from Gutenberg's printing press in Belgium, and then he established um, his own printing press in Westminster. Westminster is a place where there is Westminster Abbey. The printing press was not in Westminster Abbey. The printing press was in Westminster, where Westminster Abbey also existed. Isn't it? Did you understand? Very good. Now, uh, I was asking about uh, Thomas Beckett's assassination, 1170. In uh, which play by T.S. Eliot has he talked about Thomas Beckett's assassination? In which play by T.S. Eliot has he talked about Thomas Beckett's assassination? I'm sure everybody knows. It is? Murder in the cathedral, very good. Murder in the cathedral. On which day is he assassinated? 29th December, 1170. T.S. Eliot wrote this play from a first-hand account of an eyewitness. First-hand account of an eyewitness. Right. Uh, next question. Uh, during which king's time did Robin Hood live? During which king's time did Robin Hood live? I'm so delighted to see all the right answers coming. So many people answering. And even though some of you are going wrong, that's okay. Uh, you don't have to be right all the time. It's so delightful to... I'm really thinking... I, I thought I will just do this before this exam. But I'm really thinking I should do this kind of course as my main... Uh, one of my main courses forever. Always running course in YouTube live. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yes, I think it will be. I'm thinking about it. No, I won't delete the videos. Don't worry. Okay. In which king's time? Richard I. You're right. Richard I or Richard the Lionheart. Richard I or Richard the Lionheart. Uh, that is um, the king during whose time? Thomas, uh, sorry, Robin Hood lived. Next question is, in which novel by Walter Scott, in which novel by Walter Scott, uh, do you have the character Robin Hood? He appears under another name, uh, Lockhart, but it is Robin Hood. In which novel by Walter Scott? Tell me that. In which novel by Walter Scott does, uh, it is set in the Plantagenet dynasty. Robin, uh, you know, obviously it is set in the Plantagenet dynasty. Henry II uh, established the Plantagenet dynasty, the house of Plantagenet. Do you know? It is in the novel Ivanhoe. Ivanhoe. Yeah, Ivanhoe is set during the time of Richard the Lionheart. You are right. Many of you are writing the correct answer. Uh, then let me ask you next question. 
Watt Tyler, W A T T Y L E R, is associated with what? Watt Tyler is associated with what? Which event? Which historical event? Watt Tyler is associated with Peasants Revolt. Peasants Revolt. Do you know? Uh, who wrote a very radical political play, Watt Tyler? Somebody wrote a very radical political play called Watt Tyler. And later on, um, when this person turned away from radical politics towards conservative politics, he got into trouble for writing this play because his enemies began uh, republishing that play. Do you know which writer? Who wrote the play, the radical political play, Watt Tyler? It is Robert Sade. Robert Sade wrote Watt Tyler, which he got into trouble for because later he turned into a conservative and his enemies began publishing that play, Watt Tyler. <laughs> Did you understand? Then um, Richard, Duke of York, had two sons. Richard, Duke of York, had two sons. Edward, uh, there were two kings, Edward the Fourth and uh, Richard the Third. Edward the Fourth and Richard the Third. Uh, Richard, Duke of York, had two sons. Edward the Fourth and Richard the Third. Now, these two people, these two kings, were involved in what? Richard, Duke of York's sons, uh, Edward the Fourth and Richard the Third, were involved in what? I'm so glad to see all of you from across India uh, taking part in this discussion and answering questions. It's wonderful. <laughs> I'm glad that God gave me this opportunity to meet you all and help you all. <laughs> the two uh, kings, uh, Edward IV and Richard III, sons of Richard, Duke of York, were involved in Wars of the Roses. They were involved in Wars of the Roses. They were on the Yorkist side. Their enemy was the Lancastrian uh, Henry the Sixth. Did you understand? Their enemy was the Lancastrian Henry the Sixth. Now, um, what is the name of the um, dreamer in Pius the Plowman? What is the name of the dreamer in Pius the Plowman? It is written by William Langland, as you know. So what is the name of the dreamer? Will, standing for William. That is the name of the dreamer in Pius the Plowman. Will, standing for William. Okay, you seem to remember a lot of things. Uh, then, uh, what is the... Which is the poem by John Keats? Subtitled The Dream. It is a dream allegory. Which is the poem by John Keats? Subtitled The Dream. I'm sure you know The Fall of Hyperion, a Dream. The Fall of Hyperion, a Dream. Please read extra on all these books and uh, find out more details. You, are, you should do extra research and reading today itself. Before the next uh, every day at eight, you should do it. Otherwise, you will lag. Okay? Because your own reading and research will give you a lot of tremendous knowledge. It is not enough to listen to somebody lecturing. Somebody lecturing is necessary because it gives you a proper foundation. But after that, uh, you have to do your own research. Uh, listen to me. Uh, the fall of Hyperion, a dream. Fall of Hyperion is different from Hyperion. First, John uh, Keats wrote Hyperion. Okay, he left it unfinished because it had Miltonic overtones. It, was, it sounded too much like Milton. Then he wrote The Fall of Hyperion. That book is subtitled A Dream. Hyperion, the first book, was about Titanomachia. That means the fight between the older gods, Titans, and the younger gods called the Olympians. This is in Greek mythology. Okay? Yes. Now, uh, in which... Mm, in which uh, circle of inferno is there 
Yudas. Yudas, the man who uh, cheated Jesus Christ, is in which circle of inferno? The last circle, that is the ninth circle. In the first circle, uh, the inferno is an underground well. There are rungs of the well or the circles. And in the first topmost circle, there are the non-Christians like Homer, etc. In the last circle is Yudas, the ninth circle. Okay. And purgatory, after inferno, there is purgatory. Purgatory is a mountain. On top of the mountain is um, paradise or paradiso. Right? Okay. Um, how many sections are there in a Petrarchan sonnet? Next question. How many sections are there in a Petrarchan sonnet? Petrarchan sonnet is divided into what? There are two sections in a Petrarchan sonnet. What they are octave and sestet. Octave is eight lines, sestet is six lines. I'm talking, I'm mixing up very elementary basic questions and difficult questions uh, so that everybody will get something. Okay, right. Uh, who, uh, who, who introduced Petrarchan sonnet into English? Correct. Who introduced Petrarchan sonnet into English? It is Sir Thomas Wyatt. Thomas Wyatt introduced Petrarchan sonnet into English. And who introduced blank verse into English? That is Henry Howard Earl of Surrey. Right. And uh, how, what is Spenserian sonnet? <laughs> Spenserian sonnet. What is Spenserian sonnet? Yeah. All of you are writing very correct, the correct answers I can see. Spenserian sonnet is English sonnet, but with a different rhyme scheme. Spenserian sonnet is English sonnet, but rhyme scheme is different. Uh, English sonnet has the rhyme scheme A B B A, uh, A B A B, C D C D, E F E F. G G. That is English sonnet. A B A B C D C D E F E F G G. What is the rhyme scheme of Spenserian sonnet? It is A B A B B C B C B is continuing. C D C D E E. A B A B B C B C C D C D E E. Okay. Uh, now about Chaucer. In Chaucer's time, in which year did Black Death come to England? In which year did Black Death come to England? 1348. Many of you are saying Alexandrine. Remember, I will explain. Alexandrine is in Spenserian stanza. Before Black Death question, let me explain. There are two things you need to know. Listen to me. Um, Spenserian stanza is there. Spenserian sonnet is there. Two things are there. My question was about Spenserian sonnet. Spenserian sonnet is a 14-lined poem. It is uh, uh, English sonnet only, but rhyme scheme is different. Spenserian stanza means eight lines of iambic pentameter. Iambic pentameter eight times. After that one, Alexandrine. That is a longer line. Did you understand? Spenserian stanza means eight lines of iambic pentameter followed by Alexandrine. Okay. Now, uh, 1348 is correct. Black death or bubonic plague appeared in England for the first time in 1348. But that was not the only time it kept coming. Many times it kept coming. Okay. Right. Uh, which book by Bothius did Chaucer translate? Which book by Bothius? Remember, Bothius wrote a book in prison. Which book by Bothius did Chaucer translate? Consolation of Philosophy. Correct. Bo Chaucer translated Consolation of Philosophy. Okay. Uh, Chaucer wrote his early works in which meter... Yesterday, we discussed all this. Chaucer wrote his early works in which meter? Octosyllabic couplets. 
Chaucer wrote his early works in octosyllabic couplets. Okay, that means two, two lines, but there are eight syllables in the line. I am big tetrameter it is. Only four feet are there. I am big tetrameter. Later he added one more uh, syllable. That Then it became I am big pentameter. In which uh, uh, book did Chaucer introduce blank verse or iambic pentameter that is unrhymed? In which book did Chaucer uh, introduce blank verse that is decasyllabic couplets? That is the legend of good women. Legend of good women. Now, some of you are confused. I will explain. Both he has wrote Consolation of Philosophy. Roman de la Rose is another work. Roman de la Rose was written by Guillaume de Loris and Jean de Mew, the French names, okay? Okay, both he has wrote Consolation of Philosophy. Roman de la Rose is, um, about, is written by Guillaume de Loris and Jean de Mew. If you don't know spelling, please Google search, right? Now I will explain about uh, the meter. Many of you got wrong. Uh, Chaucer first wrote in octosyllabic couplets. Then he wrote in rhyme royal. Then he introduced the casyllabic couplet or heroic couplet. Did you understand? First, Chaucer wrote a book of the Duchess and House of Fame in octosyllabic couplets. Then Parliament of Fowls he uh, introduced. In that, in Parliament of Fowls he introduced Chaucerian stanza. And it, uh, uh, the next book that is Troilus and Cressid is also in Chaucerian stanza. Chaucerian stanza has seven lines. And after that, in Legend of Good Women, Chaucer introduced heroic couplet or decasyllabic couplet. Okay, now um, Chaucer has written the legend of Saint Cecilia. Tell me, what is Saint Cecilia the patron saint of? Chaucer has written the legend of Saint Cecilia. Uh, what is Saint Cecilia the patron saint of? Saint Cecilia is the patron saint of music. Music. Uh, Dryden has written a song for Saint Cecilia's day. Right? And uh, Alexander Pope has written an ode for St. Cecilia's Day. They all have written about St. Cecilia. Now uh, I will share my screen because I have this presentation. Remember? The Canterbury Tales. Now we have to talk about the Canterbury Tales. The Canterbury Tales was written in about 1387. And the first book of Canterbury Tales, the first uh, story in Canterbury Tales is told by the knight. Very good. The knight tells the first tale in Canterbury Tales. Okay. The last tale uh, of Canterbury Tales is told by who tells the last tale in Canterbury Tales? It is the parson. What is peculiar about the parson's tale? What is strange about Parson's Tale? Parson's Tale is in prose. Parson's Tale is in prose. Who tells the last tale in Can Sorry. Uh, the Parson's Tale is in prose. I'm just looking at your messages. Correct. Uh, Parson's Tale is not the only tale in prose. Which is the other tale in prose in Canterbury Tales? So amazing to see your answers. Yeah, the other tale in prose is Chaucer's tale of uh, Melibius. Chaucer's tale of Melibius is also in prose. First, Chaucer tells tale of Sir Topaz. After that, he tells tale of Melibius. Now, how many pilgrims are there in Canterbury Tales? How many pil uh, pilgrims are there in Canterbury Tales? There are 29 pilgrims plus Chaucer plus Harry Bailey. Did you understand? 29 pilgrims plus Chaucer plus Harry Bailey. Like that, there are 31 pilgrims altogether. There are altogether 31 pilgrims, 29 plus two. Okay. Uh, in which uh, month of Canterbury Tales, uh, in which month does Canterbury Tales begin? In which month does Canterbury Tales begin? Canterbury Tales begins in April, correct, April, Canterbury Tales begins in April. 
April is the cruelest month. Is the line from? April is the cruelest month. This a line from? The wasteland. And it refers to Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Now I will ask you about some characters in Canterbury Tales. Okay, you have to tell me which character I am describing. Very good, everybody. Uh, thank you for posting all those comments. It's wonderful. Now, uh, I'm going to ask you questions about characters. Who is the most chivalrous character in Canterbury Tales? The most chivalrous character? He is described as parfit gentle. That is knight. The knight is described as parfit gentle knight. Who, who are the two people accompanying the knight? Who are the two people accompanying the knight? They are the squire, his son, and the yeoman. The squire, his son, and the yeoman. They are accompanying the knight. Who is described as? They are together called the household group. Okay, They are together called the household group. Who is described as being as fresh as the month of May? Who is described as being as fresh as the month of May? It is the squire. The squire is described as as fresh as the month of May. He's a young man. He is, how is uh, Chaucer making fun of the squire? He, the squire is lovesick and he is unable to sleep like his father who uh, fought for Christendom in the Crusades. Our squire is also unable to sleep, but he is not fighting any religious battle. He is fighting a battle of love. Our uh, knight has taken part in 15 religious battles. Okay, there is another character in Canterbury Tales who is not at all religious, but has gone to Jerusalem three times. Another character in Canterbury Tales who is not at all religious but has gone to Can uh, Jerusalem three times. Who is that? Tell me. Crusades is religious war, correct. Who went to Jerusalem three times? It is the wife of Bath. The wife of Bath. Yeah, Squire has curly hair. So many people are saying good, good, good points. Very good, very good. Now, uh, who am who in the Canterbury wife of Bath? Correct, wife of Bath. Who in the Canterbury Tales is very fond of food? He grows a lot of uh, food in his house. In his house, always a table is set, and food and wine is snowing. If anybody goes to his house, he is a man of great hospitality. He will feed you well. Who is that man? Which character am I describing? He keeps partridges and fish in his own house and eats them also. I'm describing the Franklin. Very good. Franklin. The Franklin. Franklin is the man of hospitality. It is not monk or merchant. It is Franklin. Franklin is the man who is uh, fond of food. Uh, yeah, monk is also fond of food, but he does not feed anybody. That is different. Franklin is a man of great hospitality and he wears a medal of St. Christopher because, uh, and he's a man lo who loves pleasure. He is called Epicurus's own son. Very good. Uh, Franklin is called Epicurus's own son. All your answers are not completely wrong because Monk also loves food. He loves roast swan and uh, uh, Madame Eglantine also loves food. She eats very in an upper class manner without letting any morsel drop from her lips. She does not grease the cup from which she drinks. She's very careful about food. She drinks, uh, she eats white bread and she feeds her dogs white bread and milk at a time when people are starving in England. When people are starving in England, Madame Eglantine, the prioress, feeds white uh, bread and milk to her dogs. Did you understand? So that is uh, prioress. That is also correct. Uh, merchant um, is a man who is heavily in debt, but he is pretending that he is very learned. I mean, he is very uh, rich. He is very wealthy. He is pretending, but he is actually very, uh, very much in debt. There is another character 
who takes very good care of his food he eats very meager food very minimum food but he doesn't know the bible that means he doesn't take care of his soul another man who takes care of uh, his diet but he doesn't take care of his soul who is the character january and may story correct uh, merchant tells the story of old man january marrying young woman may yeah who is the character who takes care of it is the doctor of physique or physician the doctor of physique takes care of his food he eats very meager food only very good food only uh, minimum but he does not take care of his soul because he does not know his bible okay if uh, those of you who got wrong pay attention and remember so that is um, physician or the doctor of physique then let me ask you another man uh, this man uh, is very strict with everybody and the shepherds laborers agents everybody is scared of him he is very good at foretelling the harvest he is a ca carpenter by profession and um, he steals from his master also he has made some easy money also who is this man carpenter by profession he is um, living in a very shady place he has a torn shirt uh, not sure i think i'm wrong uh, he uh, is very strict with this profession ah correct reeve it is reeve the reeve is uh, described like that okay uh, then this character is a very good storyteller he can sing hymns uh, beautifully he sings hymns also very beautifully he has long yellow hair that he wear that he wears loose without a hood this character has long yellow hair which he wears without a hood and uh, he is cheating everybody all the pilgrims he is trying to cheat who is the character who is the character like that i'm sure it's obvious it is the pardoner the pardoner uh, yeah the uh, reeves horse's name is scott correct correct and um, the pardoner is selling fake pardons to everybody right the pardoner is selling fake pardons and uh, cheating people correct then um who is the character whose name is harry he is like the built in audience in the book he is like the built in audience in the book he is the audience for all the stories he intervenes in the stories he prevents people from telling stories when chaucer started telling a very funny tale this man intervened and stopped him yeah he says buy pardons from me yes he has a uh, pardoner has relics also correct correct tell me who is the character host the host the innkeeper or the host is harry bailey he intervenes when chaucer tells a funny tale and makes chaucer tell the tale of melibius correct very good now um when uh the wife of bath tells the story of sovereignty or freedom of women in marriage who replies to that story with the story of a very patient wife griselda correct when wife of bath tells the story of um the freedom of women in marriage who replies uh to that story with uh who replies to that story with uh the story of patient wife griselda patient wife griselda correct the clerk of oxford it is the clerk of oxford you're all great uh scholars in canterbury tales i can see wonderful i'm so happy now let me ask you some other questions which famous work in chaucer's time is divided into two parts visio and vita which famous work in chaucer's time is div uh, divided into two parts visio and vita tell me i'm waiting it is 
hires the plowman, it is fires the plowman. Fires the plowman is uh, divided into two uh, parts, visio and vita. And uh, what is each section of fires, the, correct? What is each section of fires the plowman calls? Each section is called what? Each section of fires the plowman is called? So many of you are telling me correct answer. Each section is called passes. That means step. P-A-S-S-U-S, -S, passes means steps. Each section of fires the plowman is called passes. Correct, passes or steps. Visio and Vita, I told you already. What do you mean by Visio and Vita? What do you mean by Visio and Vita? Visio means vision. Vita means, why is bone Vita called bone Vita? Vita means life. Who wrote La Vita Nova? Eight visions and 20 passes. Very good. Who wrote La Vita Nova? It is Dante. Dante wrote La Vita Nova. <laughs> then Chaucer's, uh, Chaucer's Troilus and Crescid is dedicated to Chaucer's Troilus and Crescid is dedicated to Oh, moral gover. Oh, moral gover. Very good. Correct. And uh, what is the meaning of, which is the English work by gover? Which is the English work by gover? Very good. English work by gover. Confessio amantis. Uh, what do you want me to explain? Somebody is saying, please explain it again. Uh, what do you want me to explain? Visio and Vita. Visio means vision. Vita means life. Uh, Dante wrote La Vita Nova. That means the new life. Uh, Confessio Amantis is the book written by John Gower in English. Uh, what, did the, what is the work he wrote in uh, French? Speculum Meditandis. Speculum Meditandis in French. And Vox Clementis in Latin. Vox Clementis in Latin. Confessio Amantis in English. What is the meaning of Confessio Amantis, the title? What does the title mean? Confessio Amantis, what does it mean? Confessio Amantis means the confession of a lover. The confession of a lover. Okay. Do you know uh, Chaucer, why Chaucerian stanza is called Rhyme Royal? Why Chaucerian stanza is called Rhyme Royal? Because King James the first of Scotland wrote it. King wrote it. King James the first of Scotland wrote it. That is why Chaucerian stanza came to be called Rhyme Royal. Did you understand? And Rhyme Royal, uh, in which book did he write in Rhyme Royal? Which book did James the first write in Rhyme Royal? James the first wrote the King's book or King is Square in Rhyme Royal. He wrote the King's book or King is Square in Rhyme Royal. Did you understand? Yes. Now, next question. Um, who is the very popular Scottish Chaucerian? Who wrote the Golden Targe and the Thistle and the Royce? The very famous Scottish Chaucerian who wrote the Golden Targe and the Thistle and the Royce. It is William Dunbar. William Dunbar. I'm sure many of you remember this. William Dunbar wrote the Golden Targe and the Thrissel and the Royce. The Thrissel and the Royce. Uh, what is the meaning of Royce? R O I S. In Thrissel and the Royce, what is the meaning of Royce? They will ask sometimes in exams like that. Royce means R O I S. Royce means rose. 
ROAC rose. Yeah, 15, not three. Very good. Varsha, 15, not three is the year in which William Dunbar wrote Golden Targe and the Trizil and the Royce. Very good. Then, uh, who is the most famous English Chaucerian? Who is the most famous English Chaucerian? Tell me. Most famous English Chaucerian? <laughs> John Lydgate, correct. John Lydgate uh, is the English Chaucerian. Royce means rose, correct. John Lydgate is the English Chaucerian. Uh, Somebody is asking me uh, one, one more Chaucerian stanza. Chaucerian stanza is a seven-lined stanza and it was introduced in the Parliament of Fowls and also later in uh, Troilus and Crecid and uh, Chaucerian stanza came to be called Rhyme Royal because the Scottish Chaucerian King James the first of Scotland wrote it. The Scottish Chaucerian poet who is actually King James the first of Scotland wrote it. That is why uh, uh, Chaucerian stanza came to be called Rhyme Royal. Okay, And uh, Rhyme Royal is uh, same as Chaucerian stanza. Now, um, I was asking you about, um, what was I asking? Lydgate, correct. Lydgate, I was asking you about. Lydgate wrote one book based on House of Fame. Tell me the name of the book, which is Lydgate's book based on House of Fame. Many of you are saying a lot of excellent points. Tell me, Lydgate's book based on House of Fame, I'm waiting. That is the Temple of Glass. Now, Temple of Fame is different. Temple of Glass. Temple of Fame is by, again, Temple of Fame is also based on House of Fame. Listen to me. House of Fame is by Chaucer. Lydgate wrote Temple of Glass based on House of Fame. Who wrote Temple of Fame? That question was asked in net once. Who wrote Temple of Fame? It is. Temple of Fame is by Alexander Pope. Alexander Pope. Temple of Glass is by Lydgate based on House of Fame. Temple of Fame is by Alexander Pope. Okay. And uh, which uh, uh, Lydgate wrote uh, a complaint of the Black Knight. Lydgate wrote a complaint of the Black Knight. It is also called a complaint of a lover's life. Complaint of the Black Knight or complaint of a lover's life. My question is, which book by Chaucer is, are, is this based on? Lydgate's complaint of a Black Knight or complaint of a lover's life is based on which book by Chaucer? The Book of the Duchess, correct. The Book of the Duchess, very good. Uh, it is uh, Book of the Duchess that is uh, the model for complaint of a black knight or complaint of a lover's life. In the 15th century, oh, Chaucer's contemporary, I didn't move the slide. These are the important contemporaries of Chaucer. In the 15th century, which uh, poetic genre was most popular? In the 15th century, which genre was very popular? It was the ballad. The ballad was very popular in the 15th century. The ballad. Can you name some 15th century ballads? Can you name some 15th century ballads? Sir Patrick Spence, Chevy Chase, The Wife of Usher's Well. These are 15th century ballads. Patrick Spence, Chevy Chase, The Wife of Usher's Well. Very good. All of you are answering. Right. And uh, uh, John Wycliffe translated the Bible. He was called what? He was called Dash of the Dash. What was uh, John Wycliffe called? John Wycliffe was called uh, brown, nut uh, brown Nut Maid. Yes, all these are important ballads. Tell me, John Wycliffe was called Morning Star of the Reformation. Morning Star of the Reformation. During this time, the earliest uh, uh, drama, kinds of drama originated. From the 12th century, uh, 
from the 12th century, which kind of drama existed? From the 12th century, which kind of drama existed? The miracle plays existed. From the 12th century, the miracle plays existed. After that came the mystery plays and then the morality plays. And after morality plays came what? The interludes. Interludes came. Tell me the most famous interlude. What is the name of the most famous interlude? What is the name of the most famous interlude? The Four Ps by John Haywood. The Four Ps by John Haywood. Yesterday I had given you homeworks. Many of you did it. Uh, Estates Satire was written by David Lindsay. Remember? Estates Satire was written by David Lindsay. Very good. Now, uh, whatever we said, I'm showing you here also. The Chaucerians were there. John Lydgate, King James I of Scotland. Then there was Robert Henderson, William Dunbar, Gawain Douglas, Thomas Mallory. What did he write? Everybody knows. We said yesterday also. Thomas Mallory wrote what? Thomas Mallory wrote, yeah, the four Ps. You are still answering. Thomas Mallory wrote, uh, Mortadadar. Mortadadar. The four Ps is a, uh, an interlude. Mortadadar is by Thomas Mallory. And it was published in 1485. And then drama originated in the 12th century. Remember? Everything you know. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, mystery, miracle plays first, then mystery plays, then moralities, then interludes. Very good. La morte d'adar, correct. La morte d'adar. Now we have to talk about the Renaissance. Which painting do you see here? This is a very famous painting. Which painting do you see here? Tell me. This painting is considered the epitome of Renaissance. This painting is considered the epitome of Renaissance. Which painting is this? Yeah, Varsha, you are right again. Eight books and uh, eight books and twenty-one books by Caxton printed. Yes. Tell me, this painting is the uh, the School of Athens by Raphael. This painting is the School of Athens by Raphael. Yeah, Raphael. It is very famous painting. Uh, it shows Greek philosophers. The, in the center, you have Plato and Aristotle. Uh, this, this painting shows Greek philosophers, but they have the faces of Renaissance uh, thinkers. In the center, Plato and Aristotle. Very good. Excellent. Shall we talk about the Renaissance? When was the fall of the, the Renaissance? The immediate cause of the Renaissance was the fall of Constantinople. When was the fall of Constantinople? In which year? Everybody knows. 1453. The fall of Constantinople was in 1453. Who attacked Constantinople? The Ottoman Turks attacked Constantinople. And which country is Constantinople part of? Constantinople is part of which country? It is the capital of uh, Turkey. Today, Constantinople is called Istanbul, right? So Constantin the fall of Constantinople was in 1453. Ottoman Turks attacked Constantinople, right? And Tudor rule started in England. That also led to Renaissance. Very good. Tudor rule started in England. That also led to Renaissance. Tell me, in which year did Tudor rule start? In which year did Tudor rule start? Tudor rule started in? 1485, the year in which Wars of the Roses ended. Tudor rule started in 1485, the year in which Wars of the Roses ended. It was Henry Tudor or Henry VII who killed Richard III and put an end to Wars of the Roses. Right? Then, uh, humanism and reformation. Yesterday, I talked about humanism and reformation. Remember? Humanism is the dignity given to the human being, to human experience, to human beauty. Reformation is the formation of the Protestant church. In England, it is called the Catholic, uh, sorry, the Anglican church. 
in England, it is called the Anglican Church. These are the two branches of Renaissance. Who is the father of humanism? Who is the father of humanism? Petrarch. Who is called the prince of the humanists? Prince of the humanists? Desiderius Erasmus. Very good. Remember, which is the book written by Charles Reed about Erasmus's father? Did you read upon it? You have to do extra research. Very good. All your answers are correct. The book written by Charles Reed is The Cloister and the Hearth. Okay. New learning and literary experimentation happened. Geographic discoveries and colonialism happened. Who invented the sea route to India and in which year? Who invented the sea route to India? Who invented the sea route to India? Vasco da Gama. In which year? 1490. You have to tell me. 1490. Lenin is saying Lenin discovered the sea route. Eh? Very funny. We know you did not. Vasco da Gama. In 1490, Columbus discovered New World, America. Columbus discovered New World or America. Vasco da Gama invented the sea route to India. You have to tell me uh, when did Vasco da Gama invent and when did Columbus invent? You have to tell me. They are very close, close years. 1498 is what Vasco da Gama, 1498, correct. Uh, Columbus, did you know, did not go to the New World. He did not land in America. He only went as far as, uh, Columbus only went as far as, uh, Barbados. Columbus went only as far as Barbados. 1492. That is Columbus's year. Very good. Now, Roger Ascham. What did Roger Ascham write? Which is the book on education written by Roger Ascham? Roger Ascham wrote a famous book on education called The Schoolmaster. Roger Ascham. Uh, wrote The Schoolmaster, which is a book on education. Uh, it is prescribed in some uh, universities also. Which is the novel by uh, Salman Rushdie, where a family is depicted. They are descendants of Vasco da Gama. They are saying that they are descendants of Vasco da Gama. Tell me, which is the novel by Salman Rushdie, uh, where a family is depicted who are claiming to be descendants of Vasco da Gama? That is the Moor's last sigh. In the Moor's last sigh, uh, the protagonist is Moraes Zogoibi. His uh, mother is from the Da uh, Gama family. And uh, he, she's an artist. Okay. Uh, now coming back to Roger Asham, he wrote The Schoolmaster, which is the book by Roger Asham. Uh, yes, Shambhu Prasad, that's correct. Which is the book by Roger Asham about um, archery? Archery. It is, like Shambhu said, Toxophilus. And like Santosh said, uh, Roger Asham was the tutor to Elizabeth I. Very good. Roger Asham wrote The Schoolmaster, Toxophilus. He was the tutor to Elizabeth I. What did Thomas Eliot write? What did Thomas Eliot write? Thomas Eliot wrote the book named The Governor. It is about how to rule a country. The book named The Governor. What did Thomas More write? Everybody knows. What did Thomas More? Ah, Thomas Eliot wrote another book. We'll come to that. What did Thomas More write? Thomas More wrote Utopia. Our Utopia. Now, Thomas Eliot wrote the book named The Governor. He also wrote one book on health. Do you know which is the book written by Thomas Eliot on health? It is called Castle of Health. Castle of Health. Utopia is by Thomas More. Thomas More is a character in Utopia. And uh, how many parts does it have, Utopia? Two parts. In which language was it originally written? Utopia was written in which language? Shamim, wonderful. You said that. Saima, also wonderful. Tell me, Utopia is in two parts. Two parts. In which language was it written? Latin. In which year was it written in Latin? 
15, 16, 15, 16 in Latin. In which year was it translated into English? 1557. Sorry, 1551, I think. 1551. Now, uh, which is the famous book by Erasmus that I didn't ask you. He is also a very major uh, uh, humanist. Famous book by Erasmus, the Latin title of that book, puns on the name of Thomas More. Book by Erasmus, The Praise of Folly. The Praise of Folly is by Erasmus. Uh, in Latin, it is called more encomium, more encomium, or the praise of folly, right? And uh, tell me, uh, in uh, humanism, I'm going to ask you another question. In humanism, which is preferred, philosophy or science? Which is considered more important in humanism, philosophy or science? It is philosophy. Uh, humanism gave more importance to philosophy. Yeah, puns on the name of Thomas More, uh, More and Comium. And uh, which is considered more important, moral elements or practical elements? Or is that moral elements or aesthetic elements? Sorry. Which is considered more important, moral elements or aesthetic elements? Which is more important in humanism? It is moral elements. Humanism gives more importance to moral elements. Which is considered more important in humanism? Reason or instinct or emotion? Reason on the one hand, instinct and emotion on the other hand. Which is more important? All of you are right. What is considered important in humanism is reason. Reason. Okay. And uh, then uh, Wyatt and Surrey. What did Wyatt introduce into English? We already said that. Wyatt introduced Petrarch and Sonnet into English. What else did he introduce into English? Wyatt introduced Petrarch and Sonnet. Then what else did he introduce? Terza Rima, Ottawa Rima. All these meters also Wyatt introduced. You have to type in the comment section all the important poems by Wyatt. Many of you might have studied poems by Wyatt and Surrey. Please type. Uh, important poem, uh, poems by Wyatt and important poems by Surrey in the comment section, okay? Now, what did Surrey introduce into English? Surrey introduced blank verse. Surrey introduced blank verse, okay? Uh, are you typing in important poems by Wyatt and Surrey? Total's miscellany was the first anthology in English. Total's miscellany was not its title. What was its original title? Total's Miscellany. What was the original title of Total's Miscellany? It is Songs and Sonnets. Original title of so uh, Total's Miscellany is Songs and Sonnets. 1557, yes. 1551, Utopia was translated. 1557, Total's Miscellany. Songs and Sonnets, correct. And uh, how many poems were there in all? In total, how many pairs, uh, poems were there in Total's Miscellany? How many poems were there in total, Miss Lenny? 271, correct. Uh, 271 poems were there in total, Miss Lenny. Very good. Now I'll ask you some names of uh, sonnet sequences. You tell me the authors, okay? Who is the author of the sonnet sequence, Delia? Who is the author of the sonnet sequence, Delia? Samuel Daniel, correct. Who is the author of the sonnet sequence, Amorati? Who is the author of the sonnet sequence, Amorati? Edmund Spencer. Who is the author of the sonnet sequence, Pamphylia to Amphilanthus? Who is the author of the sonnet sequence, Pamphylia to Amphilanthus? Thank you for all those people who posted names of poems. Thank you, Jinu. Yeah. Pamphylia to Amphilanthus, tell me. That is Lady Mary Roth. Lady Mary Roth wrote Pamphylia to Amphilanthus. And uh, um, who is the author of uh, Idea or Ideas Mirror? Idea or Ideas Mirror? 
it is by michael drayton michael drayton wrote idea or ideas mirror who is the author of astrophel and stella the first major sonnet sequence in english astrophel and stella it is none other than our philip sydney philip sydney now uh, let me give you a brief overview of elizabethan period elizabethan era uh, from which year to which year was elizabethan era what is the time span from which year to which year 1558 to 1603 1558 to 1603 was elizabethan era and this is the high point of uh, renaissance and uh, in which year was shakespeare born in which year was shakespeare born 1564 1564 shakespeare was born uh, in which years uh, in which year was globe theater built in the elizabethan period in which year was 16 not 1564 is uh, shakespeare's birth in which year was globe theater built globe theater was built in 1599 1599 that is also the year of another event 1599 is also the year of bishop's ban 50, uh, 1599 is also the year of bishop's ban and uh, uh, tell me uh, who died in 1599 a famous writer died in 1599 who was that who died in 1599 it is edmund spencer edmund spencer died in 1599 then tell me um, in which year did shakespeare die 1616 what was published in 1611 something very important was published in 1611 what was published in 1611 tell me authorized version of the bible authorized version of the bible was published in 1611 very good it is also called what authorized version of the bible is also called what authorized version of the bible is also called king james bible very good king james bible right uh, in which year uh, was uh, theaters closed due to uh, civil war the puritans closed the theater in which year 1642 1642 in which century did shakespeare become a cult figure and he became very famous in germany in which century was that that is 18th century why did shakespeare become important in the 18th century i will tell you let me uh, lecture for 2 minutes uh, not questions any uh, any questions but lecturing uh, in the 18th century what happened was uh, there was a spirit of nationalism and the restoration drama etc had already ended uh, at the end of the 17th century there was restoration drama the licensing act of 1737 put an end to restoration drama did you understand and uh, uh, there was a spirit of nationalism because of the hanoverian dynasty the hanoverian dynasty had come into power Uh, first there was tudor dynasty after that there was stuart dynasty after that there was hanoverian dynasty and uh, during this time uh, because there was no uh, restoration comedy drama was not there because of that uh, everybody wanted to watch shakespeare shakespeare's plays got uh, permission for enactment and shakespeare's uh, plays began to be published in book form complete works of shakespeare nicolas ro published the first 18th century edition of shakespeare and uh, then there was uh, shakespeare and actors like david garrick so many uh, developments uh, led to the popularization of shakespearean plays in the 18th century okay in which year was shakespeare's first folio published in which year was shakespeare's first folio published what uh, it is in 1623 1623 and what do you mean by folio 
when you get a paper from the press, if you fold it in one, if you fold it once, you get folio size. That means big size. Like this book, folio, big size. This is our encyclopedia. This is not folio size, but like this, it is folio. And if you fold it again into half, it is quarto size. Quarto size. Folio and quarto. Did you understand? Uh, now, uh, major playwrights got their uh, complete works published in folio format. But Shakespeare's sonnets were published in quarto format. Who published Shakespeare's sonnets in quarto format in 1609? Who published Shakespeare's sonnets in quarto format in 1609? It was Thomas Thorpe. Thomas Thorpe published Shakespeare's sonnets in quarto format in 1609. Okay, we'll talk about Shakespeare uh, later tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow is Saturday. Mm, we will have Sunday holiday. What do you say? I will teach you on Saturday, but we'll have Sunday holiday, okay? So that you can revise all this and research everything. And you need Sunday holiday, right? Yeah, Francis Mayer's uh, wrote Palladis Tamia, which has the first mention of Shakespeare. So we will end our today's session here. Please watch this video again. I want you to read extra, research extra. We will start from Shakespeare tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much. We will continue like this for uh, one, uh, one week and I hope to finish British literature by then. And uh, please do extra research. Join our Telegram group so that I can share with you information and like we, we have to decide a few things and I can get, give you quizzes and all that. Uh, I hope to uh, see you in Telegram group also. I will post the link here in the chat box. Uh, please uh, join the Telegram group and join me tomorrow also at 8 p.m. I hope you enjoyed today's session. Thank you very much.